just want to, before we begin this morning, I just want to draw your attention once again to um, the meeting that's coming up on the 6th of November. There are flyers in the back, and those flyers are not meant to stay there and collect dust. They're meant for you to take one, invite a friend, invite a Christian friend. Maybe they're at a church who uh, isn't aware of the, the meeting, uh, but we want as many people there as possible. Myself and the other pastors in the southeast of London who are in the FIC, we get together at least monthly, and we all have a deep desire that our churches would be more uh, focused and inclined and prepared to preach and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ um, in our area of the world. And so there's going to be um, some main sessions, some breakout sessions, and then I, along with uh, several other pastors, are going to participate in a Q&A panel toward the end of the meeting. So please come out. Uh, it'll be a blessing to you, and we want to make sure that we support uh, these efforts, especially when they are so aligned with our uh, foundational um, commitments in our church, which is evangelism. And as Phil has already said, it'll go perfectly with what we've been learning already in our Sunday morning evangelism <clears throat> training. So make plans today to, to both attend and to take some flyers and put them up on your refrigerator at home, take them and hand them out to a friend. Uh, I want us also to, to look around the room today. I know that half term is upon us, but whether we know someone is away because of uh, illness or they're away because of holiday, look around the room, see who isn't here and give a call, send a text, send a message saying, hey, uh, you were missed. I uh, can't wait to see you again. Uh, hope everything's all right. Praying for you just to let everyone know that even if they're missing for even good reasons that they're still missed and we still desire them to to be with us in fellowship and then just one other thing make plans right now to be here on 70, sunday evening the 7th of november for our five churches meeting we really want everyone to be a part of that service um, we i personally want uh, cold harbor church attenders and members to outnumber all the other people who come and so Let's, let's come and be a part and make a good showing. It'll be a blessing to you, I'm sure. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin uh, to look at his word this morning. Dear Lord, we've just sung, speak, O Lord, to us. And O Lord, we do pray, we pray desperately for that this moment, that through your word, you would teach us, you would speak to us, you would enlighten our minds and our hearts. You would feed us from your holy word and give us exactly what we need to live for you, to be obedient, and to minister into the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, throughout 1 John, John gives the Christian several means of examining his or her spiritual life. Some have called these opportunities to check on one's uh, uh, Christianity of vital signs of the Christian faith. These vital signs that John points out give us uh, uh, proof of our Christianity. Just as when you go to the doctor, he checks your vital signs and gives proof to a physician that your systems are all operating properly. They check your heart, your lungs, your pulse, your eyes, etc. And as we walk through one John together, there will be many times and opportunities to check our spiritual vital signs, and today is no exception. Today is one of those moments. The question um, I ask today in order to check your spiritual vital signs is, are you walking in holiness? And that is the title of the sermon today, Walking in Holiness. Dr. Stephen Lawson states, an authentic child of God will enjoy fellowship with Christ. Religion is an external activity and an outward ritual, but Christianity is intensely personal and internal. And the one who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ truly knows him and will truly walk in holiness, end quote. If you are a true child of God, if you have already been saved, if you have been converted, then you will walk in holiness, not perfect, not perfection, but in holiness, you will walk in the light. And I want us to examine 
three items from this text this morning. We're going to be looking at three verses, verses five, six, and seven, and each verse has for us uh, a, a, an item to examine. We're going to be looking at the idea of remembering that God is holy, and, and do not be deceived, and walk in holiness. So the first item is we need to remember that God is holy. Verse 5 says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. John continues by reiterating the exact message he's been proclaiming from the beginning, just as he said in verse uh, chapter 1, verse 1. The description of God as light captures the essence of his nature and is foundational to the rest of this letter. God is not a light. This isn't a metaphor, okay? There are metaphors in scripture, but John is not saying he's like the light or he is a light. No, it's not a metaphor. He's saying God is the light. Jesus declared, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have light, the light of life. God, the source of true light, bestows it on believers in the form of eternal life through his son, who is the light incarnate. Now, light speaks of his perfection his purity, and most importantly, his holiness. And I want us to examine, we've, we've looked at this in the past, but I want us to examine again that uh, ways in which God manifests his holiness. Uh, God is light, and in him there is no darkness whatsoever. Uh, last week, we discussed that God is not evil. He is not the author of evil. He has nothing to do with evil. He is perfectly pure, holy, righteous. He is holy. If he were not holy, if, if he did evil, he would not be holy. God is perfectly holy, and his holiness has been made manifest in four distinct ways. And before we can walk in holiness, we truly have to understand per, the perfect holiness of God. And we see his holiness in, in scripture in four ways. We see his holiness through his works, through his works. Psalm 145 and verse 17 says, the Lord is righteous in some of his ways. No, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. First, God's holiness is manifested in what he does. Holiness is the rule of all of his actions. Therefore, nothing but that which is perfect and excellent can proceed from him, can flow from him. You see, the reason that God created perfect creation and perfect creatures is because he is perfect. He cannot create anything which is imperfect. Now, man did a good job of soiling that perfection by our sin, but God is perfect in all that he does. He is also perfect in his law. So he's, he, is, he manifests his holiness through his works and through his law. Psalm 19, 8 and 9 says, The precepts of the Lord are right. Precepts means his, his law, his teachings. Rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Romans 7 verse 12 says, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. God manifests his holiness through his law. A.W. Pink says that the law forbids sin in all of its modifications. It's most refined as well as its grossest forms, the intent of the mind as well as the pollution of the body. 
the secret desire as well as your overt act. You see, God's law is perfect. And when we defy God's law, we prove that we are not holy and God is holy. That is the great divide between us and God the Father is that he is holy and we are not. Not only do we see God is holy, not only do we remember God is holy and he manifests his holiness in his works and his law, but also through his atonement. Psalm 22, 3 says, my God, uh, my God, this is, this is the verse that uh, Jesus uh, quotes upon the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. That's Psalm 22, 1 through 3. God's holiness was manifest upon the cross as Christ hung there, dying for our sin. A.W. Pink also says that infinite or wondrously and yet most solemnly does the atonement display God's infinite holiness and abhorrence of sin. How hateful must sin be to God for him to punish it to the utmost deserts when it was imputed to his son. How, how much does he hate sin? Christ <clears throat> upon the cross who had taken our sin, who was, uh, you know, sin, uh, bearing sin upon the cross, that God the Father turned his eyes away from Christ and could not look upon the sin. And upon the cross, Jesus says, he repeats Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because God is holy and he hates sin. He cannot stand and allow sin to persist. God's holiness is also manifested in that hatred of sin. Proverbs 3 so uh, 32 says this, for the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. Proverbs 15, 26 says, the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but gracious words are pure. God loves everything which is in conformity to his law and loathes everything which is contrary to it. Isn't that natural? If God is holy, he cannot accept that which is unholy. John says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. This is what has been proclaimed. And what we continue to proclaim is that the glory of God is on high and we fall short of it. But God is not only does he manifest sin and reveal his holiness through that, but God is completely sinless, sinless. John says in him is no darkness at all. Darkness is just simply another word for sin. There is no sin in him. There is no evil in him. God is without imperfection. He makes no mistakes. He is completely sinless. Jesus says, in Matthew 5, 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. We fall short of the glory of God. God cannot fellowship with us unless our sins are covered and we take on the perfection of Christ. John Owen, the Puritan preacher, said this, God is absolutely perfect. Whatever is of perfection is to be ascribed to him. Otherwise, he could neither be absolutely self-sufficient, all-sufficient, nor eternally blessed in him. He is absolutely perfect, inasmuch as no perfection is wanting to him. And comparatively, above all that we can conceive or, or apprehend of perfection. God is above even our greatest thoughts of perfection. He is higher than that. God is the standard and one that we cannot hope to attain. 
if we could attain the holiness of God and restore our own, our fellowship with him on our own, then Jesus would never have been needed to come to the earth. God ushers the imperfect us to fellowship with the perfect that is him. It is not our perfection that gets us in the door or into heaven, but the perfection of Jesus Christ. Christ's righteousness was imputed to us who believe so that when God sees us, he actually sees Christ's perfection. He sees Christ's sinless nature. God is perfect, and so he made a perfect way for us to have fellowship with him again, even though we are imperfect. Isn't that a wonderful thought? A God who is not supremely holy is not a God at all and not one we should waste our time with. But our God is magnificently, perfect, perfectly holy. A God worthy of our praise and our admonition and our obedience. So there is the standard. And then John says, don't be deceived. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Here's a strong question for you. Are you a liar? Are you being deceived? Are you lying to yourself and deceiving yourself? And what do I mean by these questions? What I mean is, do you say that you are a Christian? Do you say that you are a believer and yet you do not habitually walk in the light. You do not habitually walk in holiness. There is a term called nominal, which means existing in name only. Sadly, there are millions of people on the earth who claim to be Christian, but that is simply only a name. They are nothing more than a nominal Christian. They might go to church, they might give to the poor, they might give to the church, they might celebrate Christmas, they might be in a Christian nation, but the word Christian is only a name, it is not a reality. For them, nothing spiritually has changed in their life. They are simply a nominal Christian. You see, the Gnostics, as we talked about last week, claimed to be Christian. They tried to say that they had the truth. But by their life, by their testimony, by their theology, they were clearly not true Christians. And this is what John is emphatically saying. Do not be deceived as the Gnostics have been deceived and think yourself something that you are not. They walked in darkness and the light was not in them. John MacArthur says this, if truth and righteousness are absent from one's life, that person, no matter what he or she says, does not possess eternal life. They cannot belong to God because in him there is no darkness at all. God is absolutely perfect in truth and in holiness. Now, obviously, believers fall short of that perfection. We are still sinners. But he goes on, he says, but they manifest a godlike desire for and continual striving toward heavenly truth and righteousness. We make a habit of walking in holiness, not a habit of walking in darkness. Be very careful. Be very careful that you do not deceive yourself. Be very careful that you are not lying to yourself about your relationship with God through Christ. Paul is very clear. He reminds us how an unbeliever conducts himself or herself in 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 9. He says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, 
nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And some such were some of you, he says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. He says, if you are continuing habitually in sin, then the righteousness of God, the salvation of God is not in you or on you. You cannot simply confess with your mouth and nothing changes and think that you are a believer. It is more than just saying the sinner's prayer. It is God radically changing you, bringing you to new life. It is not a life of simple morality, but it is a life of morality led by obedience to God's word. And we can obey God's word because we've been transformed by the sacrifice of Christ, and we put our faith and trust in that, and we have been made new. And a believer is a new creation. We're no longer what we used to be. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Well, we need to look at our life and say, Am I habitually following in holiness? Do I have confidence in Christ as my Savior? Or am I just playing the game? Am I being deceived? <clears throat> God has given the true believer a new inner personhood made after God's own person. There is no longer unbroken righteousness However, the flesh can be dominated in the disobedient Christian can be, you know, we, we can sin. And sometimes as Christians, we can be for a time dominated by sin. And so that it makes us look for a time as an unbeliever. But overall, when we are, our life is seen, Christ is seen clearly. If there is sin, there is repentance. If there is sin, there is confession to the Lord. We want and desire to keep our lives pure and holy before God and walk in him. We are to walk in holiness and not to deceive ourselves that there's any other um, proof of our Christianity other than we walk as Jesus walked. I, I am told so many times, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I don't know if I am truly a Christian. But I come to church, I try my best. The fact is that we can know for certain if we are a child of God, the Bible is full of things that we can use to examine our life. Do we have faith in Jesus? Have we been made new? Do we desire to follow after him with our whole heart? Not in perfection, but in the power of God. We need to be remembering that God is holy. He is the standard. We don't need to deceive ourselves in thinking we are who we are not. If we're trusting in anything else other than God and Jesus Christ for our salvation, we are deceiving ourselves. And thirdly, simply, we need to walk in holiness. Look there at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Most likely, John has the Gnostics in mind who espouse the false gospel and prove themselves to be children of darkness. <clears throat> John is saying, you will walk in the light in holiness if you are truly followers of Jesus Christ, because he is the light, he is holiness. And so because of this, we will fellowship together. We won't fellowship, fellowship with the Gnostics who don't have the light, who are walking in darkness. We fellowship with those who are in the light. This fellowship is possible because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ upon the cross and in no other and through no other. Paul says to the Colossians in chapter 1, verse 20, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. 
If you have not put your faith and trust in the blood of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice upon the cross, you, your salvation is in something else, and it is not salvation. It is a rock around your neck prepared to take you uh, to the bottoms of despair and separation from God. As I said, you might at times ask, am I truly saved? Am I truly a child of God? Know this, genuine followers of Christ make a habit of walking in holiness. They make a habit of walking in the light. They uh, make a habit of walking and reading and living the truth of God's word. They do not habitually walk in sin. Are you sinning and it brings you no grief? Are you sinning and it causes you no pause? Are you sinning and it causes you no regret? Brothers and sisters, if that is true, then I fear for your souls because a true believer, when they sin, they will eventually come to a place where it grieves them and it pains them and they are desperate to confess that and repent of that to God and to bring that relationship back into full fellowship. You know, as a Christian, we can, we can mess up the fellowship, but we can never ruin the relationship between us and God. And sin will seek to, to damage the fellowship, but a true Christian will be on fire with a passion to repent and confess that sin and cling to God all the more. A genuine Christian walks, and his walk is the result of being cleansed from sin. Those who are Christian and walking in holiness share in the very character of God and will produce a testimony that reflects the holiness of Christ. We are unable to work in perfect, walk in perfection, but a true believer, their walk will be undoubtedly characterized as Christ-like. If you are truly a Christian, you will habitually walk in holiness. How do we do that? We need to be people of the word, in the word, on our knees in prayer. We need to be people in the church, connected to the church, listening to the preaching of God's word, in the fellowship, not trying to be lone wolves, doing it on our own. These are marks of Christianity. Let me turn our attention to what the gospel has to say for us. Are you trying to live a good life? Maybe you're listening, you're gonna, maybe you're watching this later at home. Maybe you're here in this place and you're trying to live a good life. You're trying to live by a moral standard. And maybe you don't realize that, that moral standard is given to you by God himself. But you never feel as though you succeed in these efforts. If I asked you this morning, if you died today, would you spend eternity with God in heaven? Or would you spend eternity from God, apart from God in hell? Would you answer, I don't know? Or I hope I would be in heaven? Please don't continue to be deceived. Please understand that you cannot earn your way into heaven. You cannot be good enough. You cannot be moral enough. You cannot give enough. You cannot be nice enough. However, you can know for certain where you will spend eternity. It comes down to faith in Christ. There is salvation in no other name but Christ. Salvation is only through him and him alone. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means everybody has sinned. You and I, I have sinned. You have sinned. God's glory is his perfection, and we, none of us, have achieved it. We have all sinned. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. From the moment that we are conceived, we are earning a wage, and that wage is death, eternal death. And though our sin costs us eternal death, Christ offers us eternal life. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that's, that's the bad news. But the good news is that Christ paid for your sin by dying upon the cross, Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
You see, you've earned that wage. You've earned that penalty. Christ has paid it, but you must believe in it in order to be saved. And then lastly, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9 through 13. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is, the, is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. And then Paul says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Though you were born into physical life, you have had a trajectory that death would lead, physical death would lead to eternal death forever. But for the believer, we were born physically once into death, but then we were born again to a spiritual new birth. And when we die, it is not death. It is life eternal. One of my favorite songs is a song called It Is Not Death to Die. And this is how it goes in, in, in part. It is not death to, to die, to leave this weary road and join the saints who dwell on high, who found their home with God. It is not death to close the eyes long dimmed with, by tears and wake in joy before your throne delivered from our fears. The chorus says, O oh Jesus, conquering the grave, your precious blood has power to save. Those who trust in you will in your mercy find that it is not death to die. There are two destinations in this life. One is life eternal with Jesus Christ through Jesus Christ's salvation. And the other is eternal death apart from Christ in hell for all eternity. But praise God for those of us who have recognized God's holiness, who are not deceived, but we have believed in Jesus Christ and we are walking in holiness Heaven awaits us. And no matter how hard the world has been, no matter how hard the life has been, no matter how sin has ravished our life, God has made a way for those who call upon his name in faith. And he promises us not only a better life now, but an eternal life in heaven. Are you sure this morning that you have been born again? If you were to die today, are you confident of your eternal destination? Are you walking in holiness, not of your own means, but through the means of the Holy Spirit? Have you fallen on your face and trust in the trust only in the blood of Jesus Christ to save you? Or are you walking in your own good works, walking in your own good deeds, hoping to be saved one day into heaven? And not realizing that your good works, your good deeds amount to absolutely nothing when it comes to whether or not you are saved. Your sin causes you to fall short of the glory of God. And the only way to be restored to fellowship with him is to have Christ's righteousness, his perfection put on us, imputed on us, covering us so that God sees him and not us. Praise God that. He who is perfect have, has made a way for we who are imperfect to be rejoined together in fellowship with him forever. Are you walking in darkness this morning? Or are you walking in holiness? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you humbly, recognizing your holiness, your righteousness, recognizing that there are none righteous, no, not one. Our <clears throat> greatest deeds are as a filthy rag to you. They amount to nothing. Therefore, we must understand that in order to be saved from our sin, in order to be restored to the Father, we must trust and believe in the perfection of Christ. We must trust and believe in his sacrifice on the cross. He was perfect and died on the cross for our sins. His shed blood covers 
our imperfections. God, we praise you for it. We thank you for it. God, I pray that if there's one here today that needs to come to know you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. If they have questions, let them come to me and ask, or, or come to someone else and ask. There are many of us who could give the right answers from your word. <clears throat> but there may, not, may there not be any obstacles for them to come to faith. God, help us, those of us who have real faith, to walk in the light, to walk in your holiness. God, we're unable to do it on our own. We pray for the Spirit's help to empower us to live righteous, holy lives. And may the, the, our light shine before men so that they may see our good works and that may turn them to belief in Jesus Christ, we pray today. Lord, we pray for our time of fellowship and food. We pray you bless the food and bless our fellowship. Pray that everyone would feel welcome to stay and to join. God, we thank you for this day. What a privilege and a pleasure it is to worship a God, the only God, the God who's made a way for the imperfect to rejoice and rejoin fellowship with the perfect. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.